Welcome to Defender Fridays, everybody. Happy Friday to you all. Our guest today, Michael Taggart, I'm super stoked to have you on. I've uh, been following your work for a long time. You're very active on, on Mastodon, at least from, from where I've seen you. Um, always posting really interesting insights for threat hunting and detection engineering. And I know you maintain a couple of really cool projects like WTF Bins, which is super cool because it's kind of like a, a consolidation of, you know, we, we already have resources for LOL bins and, and things like that, but you kind of have some of those non LOL bins that still have similar abuse paths. But I know Michael, you, you, you do a lot of work in many other areas. You run the, uh, the Taggart Institute, which is kind of, uh, as I understand it, kind of a training sort of effort to, to just kind of provide more knowledge and hands-on experience with these types of things. So Michael, I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of what you're up to and, uh, and hear about the topic you want to dive into today. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. And thanks for that great introduction. You know, the the love is mutual. I've been following uh, you and Witten for a long time. Um, and I'm really excited that I, I get to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing here. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk, we want to talk about home lab stuff today in particular, but just quickly, um, Yes, as as Eric mentioned, I run the Taggart Institute, which is a mission. It's an organization that tries to provide free or low cost tech training, fundamental tech training for uh, everyone who wants to get started in security or who is currently in the industry and wants to improve their skills or master their craft, as we say. Um, what distinguishes us not only the cost but the structure which is that we do in-depth training but we give you the we give you material and then we say it's on you to demonstrate your mastery so we give you the thing at the end that says if you can do this you have mastered this material but we're not going to like automate it because automated assessments tend to be pretty lame so we want you to be actually take ownership of your learning we'll support you as much as we want but um we want you to actually take ownership of that process. Now, as part of that, one of the things we kept noticing, and maybe some of you have noticed this too, is that during interviews or just during conversations, one, especially on the blue team, especially on the blue team, one, conver one question keeps coming up, which is, what's in your home lab? Which is kind of funny because it's like, the assumption is already that you have a home lab, right? It's like a priori and that's kind of weird because this is a job, not a religion. Now, people should have hobbies and maybe that's cyber, but maybe not, right? And so as that was happening as and as I was building my own home lab because I don't have a life, I noticed that there were kind of a lot of messy components to putting one together. And so what I wanted to try to do was um, create a resource for people who wanted to learn how to build a home lab, how to purchase one responsibly, how to run one responsibly, and do it in such a way that even the production of it and the maintenance of it was a learning experience, right? Because it's like, there are a lot of auto, super, super automated turnkey solutions, but I'm a big believer. For, I came from a sysadmin and, and developer background before I, I did you know, threat hunting. And I'm a big believer that you can defend best what you know how is built. Um, that sentence was a car crash, but you get the idea where if you have the ability to understand how something is stood up, you will understand where the flaws in that might be, especially things like uh, Kubernetes or any web application, like anything that's really complicated has a lot of moving parts. That's where the flaws are going to be found. So standing it all up is, is going to be useful. So yeah, so um, I put together the Institute and I have this book out that's going to walk you through creating a Proxmox lab. Um, Eric, could you possibly enable screen sharing? I'd love to show some stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me uh, switch you over here and you should be able to screen share now. Cheers. All right, cool. So uh, what I want to show you all today is a little bit about how, how I put together a lab. And actually, we're going to run a, a job in the lab live because I don't learn lessons. And let me first say, I love I love that you're focusing on Proxmox because um, I know that uh, with uh, Broadcom and, and VMware, um, you know, a popular choice used to be ESXi with the free version. Lord. Yeah, they're, they're they're putting it to bed, right? Like, so that sucks, man. But it's great that there's still other solutions. So I love that you're building enablement material around the more viable solution now. So excellent. Absolutely. Thank Plus, you. And I don't know if you saw the news from... Uh, 
from Broadcom where they were like, no, actually our customers are wrong. The price increases is, is good actually for them, which is quite a bold move. We'll see if it works out for them. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have a philosophy at TTI where it's like it whenever possible, we will choose an open source solution first, if it makes sense. That's why the web app course uses Zap instead of Burp because there was no material really about how to do web app pen testing using Zap in, in depth. There's plenty on Burp, right? But Zap, not so much. So, so that's a that's a philosophy that we have going on. Um, the the Home Lab Almanac walks you through producing a Proxmox lab uh, on any kind of hardware that will run it. So I use a fairly beefy, but getting a little bit long in the tooth now, uh, HP Pro Alliant that I picked up for nothing at SaveMyServer.com. So that's like the first. First hint, if you're especially if you're in the US, savemyserver.com collects um kind of the the corporate refuse um and like recycled servers that are perfectly good. They're in working order, they refurbish them for you and they sell them at a crazy discount. Um so I picked up this this uh multi-core pro liant for you know under five hundred dollars, and it's been the core of of my work for for this sort of stuff. From there, we show you how to do DevOps tools like Terraform. We use the HashiCorp vault for secrets management. So there are no clear text secrets anywhere in the lab. Um, we do uh, Packer to build your templates off of like the Windows base images and, and Linux base images, things like that. And then to manage the lab, we use Ansible. So as a present for you all, I created a, an Ansible playbook to install the Lima Charlie sensor. Uh, so I'm going to show you how that goes right now. So this is the Proxmox dashboard that I have right now. And um, I do have a victim machine that's ready to go. RDP has been enabled for it. There it is right now. I actually had this stood up for a talk I did last week at B-Sides SD. So I have some custom malware on it that I would like to test Lima Charlie against. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> this is a, a, a reverse shell um, with some system elevation capabilities that I wrote in Rust. So... Um, First things first, let's run the playbook. So we're going to, Sysmon is installed, but we're going to give it the Lima Charlie playbook. So we have it in our inventory, then we have the victim, and then we have the playbook. And then we'll show the playbook in just a second. But let's fire this off, get it running so that everything works the way that we would expect. I need my Lima Charlie deployment key, which of course I need to stop sharing to go get because I don't want you to see mine. While, while you're doing that, I'll actually make a quick comment. So so I, you kind of glossed over the, the importance and the value of having a home lab. But I think it, it's it's stated fairly regularly you know, across the industry. People say, build a home lab, build a home lab. But I will echo personally, OK, um, almost Everything that that established the foundation of my working knowledge as a practitioner in this space is as a result of building labs. So, yeah. like to give personal testimony to it for anybody that's curious, you know, on whether or not the, the juice is worth the squeeze, I would say 100% without a doubt, for the same reasons that Michael called out, right? Building that lab, while it's a bit labor intensive, unless you're doing magic like this, like you're using uh, things like Ansible, but building that lab really helps you start to um, uh, learn the fundamentals and you can't skip those, right? You can't jump to, I'm going to be a threat hunter, but I've never, I've never deployed, you know, um, uh, GPOs and I've never, you mm -hmm. know, couple shot firewall traffic. Um, you're not going to be the best threat hunter that you could be because you don't understand the core, the fundamentals. And that's one of the big benefits of going through the process of building these labs, troubleshooting the issues. And then once you've got that lab perfectly humming, right, then the real magic happens and you, you're standing on a much stronger foundation. Absolutely. You know, there is no replacement for learning hands-on. That's the only way to do it. And, and especially... In cyber in particular, because of this distinction we sometimes have between ops and security, frankly, I think that that distinction is, does more harm than good. Um, you'll have people who are defending Windows endpoints without having necessarily stood up Active Directory or really understand what Active Directory looks like. And you know who really understands Active Directory? Your adversary. Um, <laughs> like, really well, right? I, I feel like I, your, your, your understanding of AD is directly proportional to how many times you personally have broken it. Yeah, I mean, there are things like standing up a, a public key infrastructure, right? That there are so many pitfalls in it, and 
your adversary is just waiting to deploy ADCS exploits against you, right? Just waiting for you to have a vulnerable template. Um, or just waiting for you to have a Kerberosable SPN or use SPNs in 2024. But all of that, <laughs> all of that is part of the operation of Active Directory, which if you just come in as an analyst and you don't have that sort of administrative background, you may miss and you may not understand the connection between the events that you're seeing in the logs and what's actually happening on the machine. Let's see if... Uh... See if our our buddy ran here. All right, so let's see. Um, we downloaded the sensor, we installed it, and we uh, removed the files. We skipped the Linux version of it because we don't need to, and I think we're good. Let's see if we have it in our dashboard. Nope, demo gods killed me. As they will. As they will. Um, but. Beyond the Lee and Charlie stuff, one of the cool things that we can do with this is we also have, um playbooks to set up Splunk. We have playbooks to set up Elastic because I, I want you to get the experience with both kinds of seam. Um, we also have, uh, we have labs for, oh, malware analysis directly, right? And how to isolate the, how, how to isolate the equipment specifically for malware analysis so that you can examine the samples, you can deploy the samples, but they don't, impact the rest of your network um i'm a big Michael, yeah go ahead just quick question so where can folks find some of these uh these like ansible playbooks that you're you're talking about for building labs Is yeah 100 your... so uh the book goes through all of this of course in like step by step but um the Sec Lab repo is where all of this actually comes from, and that's fully open source, right? And you can just run this without buying Thanks. the book. You're more than welcome to do so. Um, and what it will do for you is it shows you how to set up a jump box, basically. So it Proxmox is the core. And then once we set up Proxmox, or once you set up Proxmox, which the book walks you through, um, we'll set up a jump box where that's where we're going to host Packer, Ansible, the HashiCorp Vault, and Terraform, all from one place in the lab. And then from there, we can create our templates. We can then deploy using Terraform, and then we can provision using Ansible, and then bring everything back down using Terraform again if we need to. Um, so yeah, all of that is here in the Sec Lab repo. The that vault, is epic, man. Thank you. The, the, the Vault integration, I'm like super proud of, honestly, because a lot of the stuff that you'll see in in places and not not to throw anybody any shade but like other labs that you'll see often do a lot of clear text um mm -hmm. secrets in the lab and it's like i can't put that in production like i can't take that particular process and then deploy it but with something like hashicorp vault you can have a controlled environment where your secrets are protected in a reasonable way yeah and and, and and to that point, shouldn't we also be eating our own our dog food, right? Like, yeah, we should be, you know, practicing what we preach. So, and, and yeah, sure, we can play that. Well, it's just a lab game, but okay, but it, it's a fine line between it's just a lab and this is the only way I know how to do it now. So, if I do it in prime, I'm going to do it the same way. So, I, I love that you kind of adopted the no, let's treat this like production. I'm gonna I'll, I'll play devil's there. advocate for a for a minute. Um, that. It's important to know where security is and where it isn't. Mm. Um, if you're attempting to build C2 tooling and test it out, like essentially build your malware, uh, whether it's MSF Venom or Cobalt Strike or whatever, uh, if you're not looking to bypass AV, it's totally fine to disable AV in your own lab environment. Yeah. I am not at all worried about crappy repeated passwords or a game of Active Directory using weak passwords, like the username is the password or the password's in the description in your lab environment. It's more about if you're going to train as you fight, if, you, if this is a replication of what you want to see in production, then yes, treat it as production. But if you know where security isn't and you're accepting of that, then I, 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 would, I would fight the other fight of it's totally fine to have yeah. weak crappy passwords that are embedded in places yes but, there's and. A, but the line is between yeah. the internals of the of the lab environment versus the externals of the lab environment right as far as the orchestration that that builds a lab environment right but yeah yeah good, i, good I think point. both no, things can that. be true simultaneously and i think jeff especially it's funny um 
actually with some of the time left i am going to try to escalate to system with defender on and see if it works um without without getting uh, yelled at but um i think that that's true especially if you're doing exploit dev something like that that's not your purpose your purpose is not to to test that level of security right at the same point, if you are thinking as a defender and you're thinking about developing a lab and also thinking as an analyst or somebody who might be in a position to make recommendations, I don't want you getting comfortable with things like an answer file living on the disk, right? Because I that's something that a lot of labs will do, but like that if that happens in production, that's the ball game. So there is, I think both things can be uh, true simultaneously. All right, let's see here. So I've got like, this bit of malware and I also have my listener. I'll also say um, a new version of the book is coming out in the next month or so that uh, adds a bunch of modules, including one on accessing all your stuff via WireGuard rather than doing like direct RDP. And I, way. yeah, it is. And doing WireGuard uh, raw, not using easy mode with tail scale. Um, because oh, oh. <laughs> Don't shame me. No, no, no. Tail scale is great, but yes. but um, for what I wanted to do, it actually made more sense to do this raw. And yeah. also the purpose is to learn the technology stack, right? So I, I wanted to force myself to like really understand how to do the hard stuff with WireGuard, like make a subnet router. And nice. so the only way to do that is to get your hands dirty. Um, yeah. So this is actually connected via that subnet router so i'm listening this is my new attack box listening for my who cares c2 it's just over tcp this was for for demo purposes so i'm going to fire this off and get my little pop-up c2 activated excellent let's see here uh, what do i get back all right i got my prompt i'll pop calc of course because why not Ah, uh, we love to see it there it is. POC and, complete. Well, we also have two built-in commands, one for persistence. So this writes to the registry uh, in current version run. And the next one is get system. And if this works, then I will have achieved token duplication uh, with system. Now, it won't tell me that I am. But, but uh, who am I? Yeah, who am I will lie to you. But uh, if uh, we analyze it, so this is kind of cool, right? So if I fire up Process Hacker, which we install via the playbooks in the lab, and I look for the running process, um, we will see that for one thing, uh, it's in handles. Let's go to general first. Mm, tokens? There we go. First of all, you'll see the debug privilege is enabled. It is done. OK, uh, <laughs> which, by the way, Explorer doesn't do by default. Even if you run something as admin, SE debug privilege is not enabled by default when you launch it by Explorer. So the C2 actually has to go through the whole process to add token privileges. But uh, once that's done, if we look at handles, uh, oh, sl oh snap, look at that. There's an impersonation token for system right there. So I do in fact have system privs right here. Uh, no Defender is on, by the way didn't do anything. Sysmon also on. So what I can do from here is I can, I was hoping to send this to Lima Charlie and see what it did, but uh, even without that, I have Sysmon running. So I can then analyze this with the Sysmon events to see what actually happened, right? Um, from a process creation, create remote thread, if there was CRT, um, process access, Point of view, so I should I can see that that connecting of the dots between um, my malware to the Win logon process where it got the token, all of those things, and that is the investigative part that I want folks to focus on rather than the setup. The setup matters, but it matters a lot more to have the investigation or the the actual uh, study be um, be the focus. Really quickly, um, I used to be a teacher. And so a lot of what I do is, is based on education theory. There is an ed theory called cognitive load theory, where you have like three kinds of load on your system resources. You have intrinsic load, which is just like how hard a thing is. There's nothing you can do about that, right? Like calculus is just tricky. There is a uh, germane load, which is the thing that you're trying to learn, which may be part of that intrinsic, but the, the, the task at hand. And then there's the extrinsic or extraneous load where it's kind of all the the fluff around the thing that you're trying to do. And in our industry, 
that extraneous load can get way too big, way too fast, especially in labs. Lab setup, if you've ever done a training where lab setup is like way too much of the time that you're spending, that's you're dealing with the too much extraneous load and you're not focusing on the thing that you want to. And by the way, if it's all new material for you, by the time you're done with that lab setup, you're spent. You don't have the cognitive capacity anymore to focus on the thing that you wanted to focus on. So all of the sec lab stuff is designed to make that part really turnkey so that you can get up and running as quickly as possible while still walking that tightrope of learning the systems that's, that build the infrastructure. Awesome insights, man. I, I posted it in, inside of uh, the chat as well, but just wanted to, to hearken to uh, know where security is. I, one of my favorite phrases from Microsoft is security boundary, right? Uh, Microsoft servicing criteria. What What is a flaw that they will probably try to fix if they can get around to it and which like UAC bypasses, UAC is not a security boundary. There are plenty of known bypasses. If you ability to run code as administrator, you also have the ability to run code as system, debug, act as part of the operating system, et cetera. Technically, there's no security boundary between running as administrator versus running in the kernel even, which is like one level beneath. Uh, but but I love demoing with just PS exec dash S. It can work locally, it can work remotely uh, uh, as well. So PS exec dash S, cmd.exe. I have a system shell it, and that's a Microsoft signed binary doing it. Yeah, exactly. And then there's a difference, of course, between, and this is where we can get into the defense part of it, what is a vulnerability and what is a risk for your environment, right? And defenders need to be aware of both, right? So whether or not Microsoft considers UAC a security boundary, whether or not it considers, uh, you know, between admin and getting to system a security boundary, uh, defenders need to know what does it mean when uh, an installer pops up consent.exe and how to look for that? Because if you are installing something and it just goes to app data local, like that's bad. But if it popped consent and the user was a local admin, uh-oh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, the other thing we have uh, in, the, in the lab I'll just mention is, is something that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of in um, kind of folks who have been in the industry for a long time, which is we use a lot of containers. And not everybody yet is up to speed on some of the more cloud native stuff like containers. And uh, I just released a course on container essentials if you want to see that. Um, but I get that containers and Docker is not everybody's favorite thing. There are reasonable arguments for and against using containers but they are being used, right? And so because they are being used and technologies built on containers are being used, defenders are obligated to know something about them. And so that is another component that a lot of the playbooks that we have take advantage of Docker and will walk you through how to use those containers to uh, get things up and running. I just wanted to call that out because especially if you've been in the industry for a while and you have sort of a more traditional IT background, that kind of stuff can seem very scary. It's not, it's not. Um, it's all built on, it's, it's all built on Linux still, so don't worry. Um, but it is something that I think can be a blind spot if you're, if you're not really paying attention. Well, what about windows containers as well? Um, uh, sometime, I think it was last year, windows introduced uh, sandbox capability to windows, which fundamentally is a container, but it's a heavy container. It's all, it's almost like a lightweight virtual machine. Um, and, 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 you know, and then add in WSL and all the other new like hypervisor type features coming to operating systems. It's unavoidable folks like containers and virtualization is now part of your visibility or your lack of visibility. And so it's absolutely something to pick up on, right? Just because you're not a DevOps expert doesn't mean you should not have some loose understanding of things like Kubernetes and, you know, and, and, and all the things that your, your, your infrastructure is built upon, right? And understanding how do we get visibility into that? Is, you know, there's some good news in some of these areas. Like if you've got hooks on a Kubernetes, you know, host, you can see what's going on in the containers kind of natively. But some of these technologies are not as straightforward, right? So you got to have, uh, you know, some experience with it or at least just some working knowledge of it. And so awesome, Michael, that you plugged that container essentials course. That's pretty slick. I don't know if there's many others like that. So I dropped a link in the chat for anybody wanting to look into that a little bit. 
I, I, the thing I was going for before, you're talking about uh, vulnerability uh, versus like, is this a risk? Is this a patchable flaw? And I, I, I will die on this soapbox that uh, I don't care whether it's a has a CVE. I don't care whether there's a patch. I care if it has risk to the business. That, that's mm -hmm. why pen test reports call them findings, not vulnerabilities, because it, it doesn't matter if it has an associated CVE. It doesn't matter the CVSS score. It matters that I can accomplish the goal or goals of the penetration test. Absolutely. And, and there's there's plenty of real world breaches that took advantage of features from start to finish. The Uber breach, where social engineered an employee to get VPN access and then credentials to the the, the secret store, the the password vault for everything, domain admin, GitHub admin, Slack admin, etc. Uh, <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter that they didn't take advantage of a, a patchable flaw. It matters that they they got access to the goods. And that that. Brings us back to you know the value of labs in a lot of ways because to demonstrate risk often in in some institutions you're going to be like well uh, we can't do that in production like okay but let me show you what happens with this kind of exploit here and then defenders can practice on those exploits in a lab environment of their own so we've been talking about home labs but I think eventually like the 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 final form of the home lab is something that you bring to work right ideally once you get hired doing something that's similar to what you've been practicing and once that happens um I think that that lab environment makes defenders better ideally this is this is maybe the hill I'll die on the best defensive training is offensive at its heart that if you if you are learning how the attacks work maybe by performing them yourself uh, maybe in a lab that you built, then you absolutely uh, are going to be better able to, de to detect and observe those behaviors in your environment. And I'll just echo that, Michael, you, you couldn't be more right. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll be talking to a student, they're like, how do you know so much about these attack tools? I'm like, because I have run these tools hundreds of times, right? Uh, you know, between Meterpreter, Cobalt Strike, Empire, all of these, I've run these things in adversary emulation exercises to create trainings, either for myself, for my team, or for the world, you know, with things like OpenSock. And so my secret weapon is I've run the same tools. I've used the same techniques. I've done these things. Now, not to the same skill level of an advanced, you know, uh, threat actor or even a, a, a full-time penetration tester, but still, you don't have to be an expert on the offensive tools. Having pushed the buttons and run the commands and then observed the telemetry will give you a significant leg up on someone who has never seen that side of the fight. So yeah, I just wanted to echo that. That's a really strong point to land to end this one on, guys. So we're at the top of the hour, folks. Thank you so much for joining us today. Join our Slack channel, slack.limacharlie.io. Thanks for joining us, Michael. It was a pleasure to have you. My pleasure, everybody. Thanks so much for having me.